Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Smith. I'm a director of product management responsible for maritime products here at Maxar Technologies. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of our Crow's Nest maritime monitoring and security solution and also provide a vignette as to how it can be used to combat uh, IE fishing. Set the stage first. At its most basic level, uh, the oceans are large. Vessels move. They operate dark in very dispersed locations. It's difficult to know what's going on up there. If you're a maritime enforcement agency, a Navy, Coast Guard, uh, knowing where to deploy resources is challenging. Uh, knowing where to deploy them so they have the greatest mission impact. Historically, the primary source of information on vessel activity was the crow's nest. You'd send a sailor up to the top in a little bucket with a telescope, have him look around and, and see what was out there. And that was the best spot to spot hazards or, or to have a better understanding of just general maritime domain awareness. Today, we've progressed, um, and what is used uh, most prevalently is AIS as a source of vessel information. And it's great in a lot of ways. Great as it contains over 200,000 vessels that report on an ongoing basis uh, in a 24-hour period. With that said, it doesn't capture the complete picture. It's only required for vessels greater than 300 tons. These are spoofed, these are turned off. doesn't work well in heavily trafficked areas. And at its core, if you're a vessel that's engaged in illicit activity, you're likely not broadcasting appropriately, saying what you're up to. So while we've made great progress from the days of the, of the old crow's nest, it's still, there's major gaps out there today. And so we've addressed that with a new crow's nest, crow's nest maritime monitoring and security solution. Our vantage point is just a little bit higher than the crow's nest of old. So we're leveraging a suite of on-orbit sensors and advanced workflows to provide maritime situational awareness over vast maritime regions. And we're doing that, as I mentioned, via a number of different sources. So we're leveraging our very high resolution optical satellites, commercial SATSAR, synthetic aperture radar, AIS, because while there is a downside to AIS, as not every vessel uses it, it can be useful for certain mission sets. We also pull in uh, RF and, and other data sets. We have innovative processes, things like AI ML based vessel detections, correlation across data sets, automation, um, particularly with our ticking and queuing solution, which I'll talk a lot about in the coming slides. Low latency alerting and then mission relevant analysis so that maritime enforcement agencies, navies, coast guards, they get actionable intelligence. They know what's going on on the ocean surface. Dark targets are eliminated. They can see vessel identity, uh, vessel activity. And they can deploy resources that effectively the areas that matter most. And we're doing this with our Crow's Nest Maritime Monitoring and Security Solution. So this solution consists of a multi-sensor SAR vessel detection service, great for covering broad areas and detecting vessels that are reporting via AIS and not reporting via AIS. Um, also with the multi-sensor approach, it's really great to, uh, it allows our customers to customize coverage and revisit uh, to meet their operational tempo. With that said, there's only so much you can get from a SAR image. So because of that, we couple it with our maritime tipping and queuing service. The maritime tipping and queuing service um, it allows us to bring optical imagery to bear to essentially get eyes on target, to illuminate dark targets on the ocean surface. So you can utilize that to, to see uh, the actual vessel, to identify the vessel, to identify vessel activity, and make informed decisions as far as what to do about it. We also op offer optical and SAR port monitoring plans, and we have an application in development to easily analyze all these data sets. And lastly, we bundle it with expert analysis from our services team. We'll run all of these kind of systems and, and provide our customers with end output. With that said, today, I'm gonna to focus on just two of these products, our multi-sensor SAR vessel detection service and our maritime Tiffany and QA capability. Next, I'm gonna give a little bit of detail on each and then I'm going to end with a little bit of a vignette as to how they can be utilized to combat IE position. Starting out with our multi-sensor SAR vessel detection service. Great for covering broad areas, uh, for detecting vessels as, as small as 10 meters in length, uh, vessels that are both reporting and not reporting via AIS. With our service, we provide information like the position of detected vessels, heading, length and bead, uh, beam, sorry, a confidence score. Uh, we provide correlation metadata from the actual AIS signal. Vessel images, uh, the SAR image chips of all the vessels. You can also get speed and class of vessel in certain conditions. 
So really, really compelling capability uh, for covering broad areas and just having uh, an enhanced view of, of maritime activity. With that said, there's some shortcomings on a SAR vessel detection capability. Um, it's great, again, for just covering broad areas and get uh, images irrespective of cloud cover. One downside optical, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but there's only so much information you can get out of an image of a vessel from a SAR scan. So what I have here is an example of a coarse resolution mode that a number of our customers utilize. It covers a very broad area. And with this, we can detect vessels greater than 25 meters in length. But can't tell the type of vessel uh, from this, this SAR image chip. Can't tell the activity the vessel's engaged in. And certainly can't utilize this to identify the vessel. And so now going back in time a couple of years, we realized the power of coupling SAR with optical. This was in 2019, um, and we were just kind of testing out the combined capability of, of tasking the SAR, detecting vessels with SAR, and doing the same for optical. And in this year instance, we were trying to tip and cue, but it was a very manual process. I think it ended up just essentially being tasking in the same spot. And suddenly you could see the power of it though, where First on the left, you see the SAR image of the vessels. In this case, it would be Adrian Daria One and I believe the Jasmine oil tankers. They were engaged in illicit oil transfer off the coast of Syria. But from that blip from SAR, you can't necessarily tell all that information. But then pulling in the high resolution optical, it becomes clear. So coupling the two, the all weather capability of SAR, the broad area coverage of SAR, the ability to leverage optical to identify vessels provides just a much more complete solution. So we invested heavily in that so that unlike what it was like in 2019, where it was an annual process at best, where maybe you got it with co-collects, maybe you're able to actually analyze the SAR collect and you know, uh, were able to actually task the satellite and optical and get output, we, we invested in automation to make that simple. And that's where our maritime tipping and queuing service comes in. We make it easy to get images of vessels. We do so in three primary ways. First, we allow customers to do it in a fully automated way where they define parameters or, or rule sets of vessels of interest based off of metadata within AIS and within our multi-sensor SAR vessel detection capability. It could be things like dark targets of a certain size and a certain location. When those conditions are met, we automatically estimate the location of those vessels at the time of our next satellite pass. We task our satellites, collect the imagery, process the imagery, exploit the imagery with AIML-based uh, vessel detections, and correlate those detections to AIS. And we deliver the output in low latency alerts to our customers. Similar on the AIS side, where a customer could say, look for um, you know, uh, reefer vessels or, or MMSI numbers of vessels known to be engaged in illicit fishing activity. And whenever uh, we have an available satellite pass, uh, and we estimate the location of those vessels, and we do all that back-end processing, just deliver them the images of vessels to our customers. We also allow customers to hit an API and task our satellites directly. This is great for customers that have all of their own proprietary data sets in-house, advanced systems and alerting, where they just want to integrate the optical into their existing workflows. And that API is a, a great solution for that. We also offer watch box tipping. Um, this is just essentially defining area of interest. We will tip within that area based off of our own kind of proprietary insights or insights from other customers, and we'll deliver them the output to you. Um, so a nice way of kind of getting a, a general pattern of life, say pre-ops over a broader area or an area where a mission's going to occur prior to actually doing kind of the, the tipping and tasking on your end. I'm going to provide a couple of examples of that. First, I have a SAR dark target tipping example, uh, which you're seeing here. On the left, uh, what I have is a map view with first a maroon icon being the multi-sensor SAR vessel detection service dark target that we detected. With that, we estimate the location of the vessel at the next satellite pass. In this instance, it was with a coarse resolution beam mode, so there's ambiguity on the direction of the vessel. Said differently, we knew the orientation of the vessel in the water, but we didn't know the true direction. So we took that into account with our, with our uh, projection of where the vessel could be, that gray box enveloping the vessel. We fed that information then to our collection planning system, and we were able to collect those yellow strips over the gray box. Within those yellow strips, what you can see are polygons, in this instance, red polygons, which
which represent vessels we detected within the optical image that we were unable to correlate to AIS, so dark targets. You can click on any of those and get a nice image of the vessel, in this case, a, a small fishing craft. What I have next here is an example of our chip view. In this, all of the vessels we detected within our optical imagery, we have lined up. So you can quickly scan through and look for vessels of interest based off of your end mission, whether you're looking for, say, military craft, uh, vessels engaged in fishing activity, tankers engaged in transshipment, you name it. Very quick and easy way to go through it. We also offer a number of different kind of metadata capabilities within our detections. So uh, type of vessel, length of vessel, beam of vessel, uh, heading of vessel, and we have speed of vessel, uh, something that should be on the roadmap here uh, in the next few months that will be implemented into the service as well. In instances where we're able to correlate this information to AIS, we show it side by side. So you see all the information that we detected within our AIML-based detection versus the AIS signal. So you can both interrogate the quality of our metadata and also the quality of the AIS signal. So many instances, the information that's being broadcast is inaccurate. So with that, now that you've got the basic kind of overview of these, these two capabilities, what I want to do next is just give a short vignette as to how they've been deployed uh, to combat illicit uh, IUU fishing. So uh, military intelligence agency uh, was interested in monitoring state-sponsored commercial fishing vessels uh, in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, off the, the waters of the Galapagos. Um, they wanted to use commercial data sets as uh, a lot of the proprietary assets they had access to. They, they weren't able to share with coalition partners. So they deployed Crow's Nest to provide forensic grade evidence of IUU activity. So the way we deployed this is we deployed it with our expert services team where they started out with a detailed pattern of life analysis when they analyzed AIS. They analyzed open source information, other information, things along those lines. They had an understanding then of kind of the vessels that they were interested in, and then utilized that to hone in the areas where they wanted to task SAR, our multi-sensor SAR vessel detection service. We then continued to iterate that on that, selected the different theme modes, different revisits, got SAR dark vessel detections back. We then set up rule sets for automated tipping so that we could bring optical into the solution too. Um, with that, got optical vessel detection, which then fed back into where we were detecting with SAR and tasking and, and continued to kind of hone in onto the areas that, that were going to have the biggest mission impact. And so that kind of created a virtuous cycle, which allowed us to provide detailed insights at the end to, the, to our customer. Since then, uh, there's a couple of different things that we can add to this mix. Uh, one, we can add uh, RF from a number of different commercial providers uh, to help inform the pattern of life analysis portion of it. RF is, is useful at this stage for kind of covering broad areas, getting an understanding of, of vessel activity. Timelines are, are still a bit of a challenge. Accuracy is still a little bit of a challenge, making it harder for operational decision making, but we still view it as an incredibly useful technology for pattern of life. And I think it will have a lot of um, uh, applicability for more operational workflows uh, as the technology matures. Second, we now have the ability to integrate customer tips uh, into this kind of workflow via the API, which is exciting for customers who have their own proprietary systems and, and analytics in place. So with this, going back to kind of that workflow, we started with the uh, pattern of life analysis. Uh, this shows some of the insights we saw with AIS where it showed um, activity uh, of the kind of foreign fishing fleet that we were monitoring just outside of the Ecuadorian EEV. Uh, as you can see, strong concentration of vessels there. And then on the right, what you can see is the limited number of vessels uh, within the EEV that were broadcasting. So this helped to inform kind of where we should be looking. We deployed uh, SAR, multi-sensor SAR vessel detection. And this then gave more insights into vessel activity, where suddenly you saw dark targets within the EEZ. We analyzed historical up archive, we were tasking, and were able to, to just start to see activity. With that said, we couldn't confirm the activity that was occurring based off of those SAR image chips. That's where we brought optical into there. 
and suddenly were able to definitively say the kind of activity that was occurring, provided evidence of spoofing, dark transshipments, and phishing activity. Here on this slide, I'm showing examples of those transshipments where you can absolutely see the transshipment activity occurring. The one on the left, you can see the refrigerated cargo holds open. Uh, the actual reefer vessel, um, the larger vessel that's offload or where our cargo is being offloaded onto, was broadcasting the AIS. But the smaller uh, trawler was not, it's operating dark. Um, and so if you're looking at a number of different data sets, you have no idea this activity was occurring. But with optical, it's clear. It's clear the activity that's occurring is definitive proof. The one on the right, too, uh, was a similar situation where the, the larger refill vessel was broadcasting via AIS. The smaller one was not. This one was particularly interesting because it was a long line vessel, uh, which should not have been engaged in transshipment activity in the location that it was. So by being able to see this, you see immediately that illicit activity had occurred, something that, again, is, is unique to being able to, to leverage optical uh, for this problem set. Next up, I have examples of uh, just uh, dark fishing activity. Um, so uh, we were able to capture images of vessels both inside the EEZ and outside of the EEZ of Ecuador uh, engaged in fishing activity. Starting at the left, we actually first have a vessel that's clearly not actively fishing, which is also useful information. In this instance, you can also tell it's not moving, which appears to be loitering, which is in and of itself a potentially uh, useful information. And then the two on the right, or the middle image and the one on the right, in those you can clearly see that those vessels are engaged in fishing activity with lines off the vessels. The one in the middle is with our Worldview 3 satellite, which has 30 centimeter resolution. The one on the right is with our uh, Worldview 2 asset, which has 50 centimeter resolution. Uh, but macro point here is irrespective of what satellite we're using within our arsenal, you can very clearly see fishing lines. So, it's another tool in the tool set to, to be able to actually see what's going on on the ocean surface. And this, in, in this kind of time period, there was a lot of clear weather, so we were able to get a number of fantastic shots. That's not also always the case with optical due to clouds. One thing that's, that's worth mentioning with this service is we offer cloud cover protection. Customers only pay for the cloud-free portions of images that we collect. Um, so there's no risk of, of really paying for something that you're not able to leverage. So going back to the illicit fishing uh, vignette, we packaged all of this information, all this insights, and we're able to definitively show our military intelligence uh, customer that IUU fishing activity was occurring, that there was illegal fishing within the EZ and other protected areas by dark vessels. A transshipment was used to mask that dark uh, uh, and illicit fishing activity. We're also able to show that spoofing is used. Uh, we're able to show this by collecting imagery of the ocean where there's an AIS signal, yet absolutely no vessel. You could show that definitively. And also by showing that in many instances, the way that these vessels were broadcasting was completely inaccurate. Um, so again, just with optical imagery, being able to definitively prove that. Um, and if you think about this, this is replicable, replicable uh, for IUU activity uh, and counter IUU missions in other parts of the world as well, not just in the Galapagos. And it also for other maritime use cases, these same systems, these same kind of workflows, these same capabilities could be used for sovereignty protection, um, counter trafficking, smuggling, you name it. Um, so while I focused on fishing for this presentation, um, it's much more applicable to a broader maritime mission. Last thing uh, that I want to cover uh, is just a, a more macro update for Maxar, uh, which is we have a new constellation coming online, Worldview Legion. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because it's, it's truly ideally suited for maritime missions. Uh, some of the major headlines are it will enable up to 15 revisits per day uh, in certain areas of the world which if you think about um, the applicability of that for tipping and queuing, it just gives that many more opportunities to capture images of, of vessels as they're doing things of interest. We're also tripling our 30 centimeter capacity um, and just tripling our overall capacity in high demand areas. So a lot of really compelling capabilities. Um, I believe first two satellite, uh, satellites will be launched here um, coming up relatively soon. So very excited to leverage uh, this new constellation for the maritime mission. 
And with that, I'm going to close. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. If you'd like to learn more, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to my colleague, John Roos. He's the sales director, uh, director for Canada, um, and he's, he's very knowledgeable on this solution. And he's also happy to pull me in or um, other experts on the MaxR team as needed. So thank you again, and looking forward to answering any questions you have. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. Very interesting. Um, what an amazing new service that uh, Maxar is providing. To let the audience know, we're open for Q&A, so please put your questions in the Q&A system in the Zoom. We've already got one question that's come in. Brian, beyond mitigating uh, IUU, what other maritime missions are you addressing today? Thanks for that question. Um... Beyond IUU, we serve a number of different maritime missions. Uh, we have a number of navies and coast guards that are actively using the service for things like sovereignty protection, understanding where adversaries are, uh, you know, if they're potentially encroaching upon their EEZs or territorial waters, understanding what vessels are in ports. Uh, so that's a mission we're serving today. In addition, we're doing a lot of counter smuggling work. Um, so monitoring various kind of routes where uh, where smuggling is occurring over water, uh, looking for transshipment activity, um, and being able then to, to identify the vessels so that we can provide that information to, to relevant authorities. So those are some other examples, but really, if you think of any of the maritime missions um, that these organizations face, um, you know, this, this data sets, these systems are applicable. Cool, thanks. Um, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about so who's picking up these services right now? Is it more the public sector or the private sector? You know, it's a, it's a bit of a mix. Uh, so a significant number of public sector organizations, as I've mentioned, navies, uh, coast guards, other maritime enforcement agencies. On the private side, we have some organizations that are worried about um, just kind of uh, potentially monitoring uh, smuggling type activity, like I mentioned. We also have some uh, global development organizations that are utilizing our capabilities to combat IEU fishing. Um, so a mix of, of public private are, are using um, the, the crow's nest uh, product suite. Um, so the service that you're providing, how like, what's the turnaround time for clients? Like it, it must have to be pretty quick. This stuff is happening in real time. Um, on the SAR side, we're delivering generally speaking in under an hour for our vessel detections. Um, on the optical, it takes a little longer, but we're able to take tips in up to 45 minutes prior to a collection. Um, so actually tasking our satellites within that timeline. And then from collection to delivery of output, median timeline in the South China Sea right now uh, for some operational missions uh, is about two and a half hours, two hours, 45 minutes after collection. So within relevant timelines for entities to make actionable decisions based upon the information. So the missions that you use with this service, they're task missions. You, you can't Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're not looking at everything all the time. That's correct. Yes, it's a it's a, a tasking model, and it's just the oceans are big, vessels move. It's hard to have kind of continual global coverage of all the areas of interest. So as a result of that, we really focus on the areas that matter most to our customers via via tasking model. So when you know there's a process when companies come up with, hey, we think this would be a good idea. We think our customers or there's potential use for this. Um, you go through that process, then you, you trial things um, from that process and now being in operation. Have you learned anything uh, surprising, interesting that you could share with us that maybe you weren't expecting to learn about the illegal um, goings on around the world, I guess? To put it, I don't know how to put it. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a really good question. I'm trying to think of what I can share as far as some of the things that yeah, we, generalities, um, maybe like we didn't expect to see as much of this as we've seen or something. You know, that's yeah. So one thing going in is uh, we started tipping off of the AIS and we frankly didn't think that that would be very useful just because the vessels are broadcasting. They're saying they're out there, but in tipping on it, we learned just that it's incredibly useful because first you see a lot of vessels around it that might be dark, around the target you're tipping off of, if you hone in on the right vessels. 
second, those vessels that are broadcasting, they don't necessarily know that anyone's looking at them from above. So they still are often engaged in illicit activity that could be engaged in transshipment with a vessel that's not broadcasting or something else. Um, and being able to see that activity is incredibly useful then too. So that's been a, a major kind of learning, something that we didn't anticipate um, via, via, as you mentioned, all these pilots and projects that we've run. Uh, would you be able to share any regional hotspots that are particularly interesting that uh, people might not be aware of? You know, it's it's all the ones I think that people would expect um, are are where our customers are looking. The challenge is even when you expect it to be a hot spot, you don't know necessarily that something's happening. Like there are difficult regions to monitor. Um, so I think the less so, you know, having any sort of, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a, a new area that I think would be mind blowing for folks, but. It's more so kind of areas you'd maybe expect, but being able to provide definitive evidence that something's happening. Okay. Um, are there any NGOs? You know, NGOs were, you know, the climate change is our, our theme for the conference. There's a lot of NGOs in the climate change space. There's things like things going on that affect the environment, like uh, dumping uh, bilges and things like that. I don't know if that's part of this program. I know SARS pretty good at detecting um, surface roughnesses, uh, changes. It, it jumps out pretty strongly. Is there anything you can say about that? Uh, and NGOs, yeah. any NGOs using your program? Yeah. Sorry, I kind of lost my uh, thought there. <laughs> I'm tracking, good question. Um, we work closely with uh, with NGOs. So uh, one kind of, uh, frankly, one of my favorite customers I work with is Allen AI, previously Balkan which has a, a mandate to combat illegal fishing globally. And they'll work with various local authorities across the globe. Um, so we work incredibly closely with them to, to monitor illegal fishing in, in various areas. Um, we also have uh, a number of other kind of NGOs we'll work with in, in pro bono type fashion. Um, so it's something that it aligns with Maxar's kind of purpose, vision, and values. Um, you know, we try to do what's right. Um, and it's something that it, on a personal level, I really enjoy doing. So, okay, that's great to know. Um, uh, yeah, Maxar provides a lot of imagery in disaster situations, in crisis situations. I know that it's very much appreciated. A big thank you to Maxar for doing that. We've got some questions coming in. Uh, one from Fiona. What action would your client be able to take after identification of the illegal fishing? Are they able to actually intercept and prosecute the offenders? Uh, that that does happen. It, it depends really upon what kind of uh, activity has been uh, has been identified based off of the, the imagery. In some instances, they're able to deploy resources and others. It's just it's useful for having a better pattern of life and knowing where to deploy things in the future. Um, so a bit of a mix based off the use case, based off the location, based off of the internal capabilities of our customers. We've got another question coming in. Um, from an international development perspective, is illegal activity more common among Western actors in the waters from resource poor countries? Are these statistics reported generally to UN level databases? That's a great question. And I, I frankly don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I had a, a good answer on that, but I, I don't. And I, I don't even want to try and give something that's inaccurate, but um, I'll have to do some research after this. Great, we're, we're coming up to the break. I wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the workshops. If you give us uh, any, uh, you've got two coming up in our workshop week. One is the weather desk on March 8th, and then you've got a user uh, workshop March 10th coming up. Um, both should be really exciting. Weather desk is a fantastic product, um, really differentiated versus other weather services out there um, and useful for a variety of different uh, end customer needs. Um, the user workshop will also be incredibly helpful just to get a better sense of how you can utilize Maxar's various product offerings. So would very much encourage folks to join. And um, Jonathan, thanks. I appreciate your, your questions um, and, and everyone here and their time and attention. Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you to Maxar for being our platinum sponsor. Uh, Maxar has been with us since the very start of GeoIgnite, Canada's National Geospatial Conference. We really appreciate that.